Each year in Canada, between 70 and 80,000 people go missing. Most are found within a few days and unfortunately, others are added to the growing list of long-term missing and murdered Canadians. These are four of their stories. In August of 1996, when he was 34 years old, Bruce Birdlot asked his mother for $1,000, said he was going away for a while, called some friends in Manitoba, and without explanation, walked out the door of his family's home in Leamington, Ontario, and was never heard from again. Bruce grew up in Leamington, played hockey in his youth, and lived in Manitoba for a period of time. He was a skilled carpenter who enjoyed boating and fishing. He eventually returned to Leamington to work as a bartender at the International Hotel, a neighborhood bar in a two-story brick building on the corner of Erie Street South, owned by the Birdlot family. At the time of his disappearance, Bruce smoked cigarettes, drank beer and had been unemployed for several months due to his struggles with bipolar disorder. After Bruce left home, his family initially believed he may have traveled west. They searched for years across Canada, focusing their early efforts in Manitoba. They attempted to locate him at fishing lodges in the northern part of the province without success. Mabel Crumback was last seen at her home in Toronto on May 28, 1950. The last person to see Mabel was a man named Jim Bryan, who told police he left the home at 12.30 a.m. on Sunday. When he returned the next day for dinner, Mabel was missing. Her younger brother, Gary, said he woke up Sunday morning to find his sister was missing. Gary then told the neighbors, who informed the police. Gary said he woke at about 2 a.m. to hear what he thought was the dog barking and the sounds of Mabel's voice mixed in with the voices of men. There were two doors to the house, Willard Avenue and a door facing towards St. John Road. The Willard Avenue door was found unlocked and the St. John Road door was also unlocked and open. Neighbors walking past the Crumbach home at about 2 a.m. said they heard some loud noises coming from the residence. The lights in Mabel's room and the kitchen were on and the side door was open. An investigation revealed that Mabel's bed had been slept in that night. Mabel Crumbach's parents had been to Detroit, Michigan over the weekend and Mabel's further told police she didn't have any money or a key to the house. Mabel's purse was found in her room with her money still in it. Her pajama bottoms were found neatly folded under her pillow, but her pajama top was never found. Mabel was employed in the office of the Eastern Steel Company she was religious and attended the St. John's Baptist Church. At church she sang in the choir and was active in the church's social functions. Details Date of Birth 1931 age at time of disappearance, 19 years old height and weight at time of disappearance, 5 feet 1 inch distinguishing characteristics, white female, dark hair and a fair complexion, clothing, a red and black plaid shirt, a navy blue pleated skirt, black suede pumps, but no hat or coat. Jan Isina, Jan. Stonehouse disappeared on August 8, 1983 from her home in Oakville, Ontario. She was 16 years old. It is believed Jan left her home because she was pregnant. At the time, her mother was sick and in the hospital, she died a short time after Jan disappeared. Although Jan had run away in the past, her father became concerned and reported her missing when she failed to return for her mother's funeral. She was known as Jan by friends and known as Sina by family. Some agencies list her first name as Ginizina or Ginizina. Investigators believe her disappearance is tied to that of Darlene Von Tucker, 16, also of Oakville. Darlene Tucker was a grade 10 student at the former General Wolfe High School on McGrani Street. She was last seen on February 14, 1983, six months before Jan Stonehouse disappeared. She was friends with Jan Stonehouse. Tucker fled her home on Lake Shore Road West after she discovered she was pregnant and an argument with her mother ensued. She stayed with her boyfriend in another part of Oakville for several weeks, but eventually left his house after an argument about another boyfriend she had in Toronto. 
Nobody knows exactly what happened after she left her boyfriend's house, but it's believed she went to Toronto for a period of time. The father of her boyfriend in Oakville was the one who eventually reported her missing to Halton Regional Police. In the months following her disappearance, Darlene Tucker made several calls to her mother from a payphone in Huntsville, Ontario. In 1985, Tucker was spotted working as a waitress in Toronto. It was the year she turned 18, she never collected the money from her trust, which would have been available to her that year. In 1987, there was a confirmed sighting of Darlene and Jan together in the Halliburton area, or in Huntsville, depending on the source, where the Tucker family had a vacation trailer. This was the last confirmed sighting of either girl. Despite many tips over the years, investigators have never been able to locate them, and at the very least, confirm their safety. Jan's parents are deceased and she has no siblings. Darlene's family continues to search for her and would like to know that she is safe. Darlene Tucker has a prominent gap between her two front teeth. She also had a skin allergy on her hands, which caused them to break out in blisters. On August 13, 1967, 14-year-old Sylvia Linda Clay was at her family's cabin in Bree Lake, Manitoba, with her father and two siblings. Sylvia had spent the morning arguing with her father. At around 11 a.m., without saying a word, she ran off into the woods wearing an orange and beige pop top with beige squares and orange lines, blue and green Bermuda-style shorts and brown sandals. She was never seen again. When Sylvia didn't return for lunch, she was reported missing to police, who initially classified her case as a runaway, as she left the cabin on her own accord. Early coverage of Sylvia's disappearance suggests she may have tried to make it to Ottawa, a journey of over 2,000 kilometers, which would have taken her along the Trans-Canada Highway, or possibly across the border near Pembina, North Dakota via I-29. Sylvia was never seen in Ottawa. Ground searches of the area failed to uncover any trace of her, and she never attempted to make contact with their family or anyone she knew. Now, over 52 years later, investigators are treating her disappearance as a suspected homicide. Sylvia Clear has brown eyes, a thin build and a light complexion. She was 5 apostrophe 6, 119 pounds and had long brown hair at the time of her disappearance. She was born in 1953 and may use the surname Sipronovich. You or someone you know might have the clues needed to give her family the answers they've been waiting over 52 years for. It's never too late, and no tip is too small. If you have any information on the whereabouts of any of these folks, please contact your local authorities. It is not too late as someone is still looking for them. If you like what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you'd like to, you can follow me at Twitter. The handle is at Fuzzy Pantaloons. And I'll see you all next time.